assalamu alaikum i'm dr faryal razak and today we are very pleased and very honored that uh, we are here with uh, emeritus professor uh, 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 professor steven uh, mint and uh, uh, dr saab uh, is uh, had been a professor in calpoli uh, he's been an emeritus professor for accounting but he is uh, most popularly known as the ethics sage he runs his three blogs with one of them is best one of the best in the you know ethics uh, blog uh, highest rank ethics blog and uh, he has uh, written a book and uh, recently has published this book and today we're going to ask him um, uh, to tell us a little bit about how he started his career and from accounting to ethics i mean this journey from accounting to ethics we would like to hear from him as well uh, sir welcome to the show and we are very honored very pleased uh, to have you here thank you so much for uh, being with us thank you for be- thank you for the invite i appreciate it okay sir uh, first of all sir i would like to know that uh, 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 tell us about a little bit about your background your education um, and uh, our viewers would really like to get to know you uh, what what are your accomplishment how how did you proceed please i would like you to uh, talk about it a little bit sure i started off my professional career in public accounting working as a cpa i guess uh, the equivalent for you would be chartered accountant wow and, uh, yeah and i worked for a few years and realized that i didn't want to do this for the rest of my life so i tried teaching on a trial basis and really liked it students seemed to like me so that was the initial impetus for me to get a doctoral degree because in here in the states if you don't have a doctoral degree even in accounting it's hard to get a job so i went really? to, yeah i went to the george washington university got a doctoral degree and actually that's where i first got in, interested in ethics which was part of my background anyway having been a cpa accountants need high ethics but um i had to write a doctoral dissertation and i chose to write it on international accounting where i study different cultures because the cultures establish the business environment and the business environment sets the background for accounting rules so i wrote this dissertation on international accounting and realized there were a lot of ethical issues that were involved and that's where i first decided to start writing research papers on ethics well yeah. after i received my phd and i started my teaching in the california state university moving around from place to place i was uh, an accounting department chair a dean of a business school and then wow. just 4 years ago uh 4 years ago i retired and that's when i became an emeritus professor during that time a little bit before i retired i went into blogging as you mentioned and started to get a uh reputation for the blogs and that led me to writing the book uh which is called beyond happiness and meaning transforming your life through ethical behavior so wow. i contend that if a person is ethical tries to do the right thing they can be happier and achieve more meaning in life because they'll be respected for what they're doing and their self esteem would be built and i just try to link the two it's sort of a broad view of wellness and ethical and how that happens amazing i mean i would really like to read the book and uh, is this uh, book available on amazon and uh, where have you published it uh, please do share the link with us so we can share with our viewers uh, the link of the book yeah well uh, this is what it looks like yeah, um, happiness and meaning 
Yeah, it is on Amazon. It's also on my website, which is just stephenmensethics.com, all one word. Um, but uh, it's, it's a good price on Amazon, and I think people will enjoy reading it because one of the things I do is go through actual case studies. Why some people did the wrong thing, why some people were able to do the right thing. And I kind of approach the issue of why do good people sometimes do bad things? And that's an important message, I think, for students to learn. Because inherently, I think we all of us think that we are inside, we are good people. But when we do bad stuff, I mean, that's a very interesting thing. I would really like to uh, talk about it more and maybe may have another session or to talk about it in detail. Sure. So I really like the idea um, and uh, of uh, that uh, connecting it with ethics. And the uh, title says Beyond Happiness and Beyond Meaning. So um, tell us the significance of like beyond happiness and beyond meaning. Usually books are written to become happy or to find the meaning, but you went beyond it. So uh, please tell us about that. Right. But in being an ethical person, which of course means a lot of things, that's probably uh, a session in and of itself, but by being an ethical person and striving to achieve happiness and meaning, both, not one. If you're successful, you're going to satisfy your purpose in life, or at least that's the thesis, that you can essentially simplify it by saying, be all that you can be in life. Maximize your value, not only to yourself, but others. And that's a very high standard because as good as we try to be, there are all these pressures in the workplace from superiors who tell us to do things that we really don't want to, but we're afraid if we don't do it, do it we'll be retaliated against. Um, a lot of times we rationalize unethical behavior. And that would be in part because we don't want to be part of the canceled culture. So uh, achieving all you can achieve, the, the word for it, there is a theory about um, how you meet a hierarchy of needs, psychology of needs by Abraham Maslow, which basically sees, uh, says you're trying to achieve a level of self-actualization which is a, a more technical form of being all that you can be. So if you're ethical, not only will you be happy in life and have meaning, you'll go beyond that, which is a very difficult thing to do. And this is why it is important to realize that as well. You talked about the cancel culture. I mean, this is a kind of a new phenomenon that has evolved in, in the recent, recent you know, times. So I would, we would uh, like to talk about that. Uh, what are your views about and why it is happening, this cancel culture? Yes, it's been going on for quite a few years in the States. I think the, the root of this problem is the di diversity in society, divisions in society, uh, one group wanting to do this, another group wanting to do that. And I always say that one of the problems is we, we don't know how to disagree with each other anymore without being disagreeable. So it's a kind of in your face mentality and the idea is to make the other group that we don't agree with look very bad. Sort of what we call I gotcha moments. <laughs> and that's done by calling them out in public, embarrassing them, and trying to get people, usually on social media, to move away from that individual, don't respect them anymore, and, you know, this could really end the person's career taken to an extreme. And all that has to happen here is for someone to have said something or did something years ago. I mean, it could be 20, 30 years ago 
you find this one quote on social media and this group wants to cancel the person. Now, how many people haven't said something or done something in their life they regret? But the key thing is you have to apologize for things like that. If you don't apologize and take personal responsibility, that's more likely to bring up the cancel culture. So we're even having that now with our uh, protests about social justice and um, protests in the street, defacing monuments, uh, looting stores. It's, it's just this group against that group. And it's created a lot of animosity and I think even borderline hatred. So once you start this cancel culture, if you don't go along with the group you belong to that's canceling someone else, you don't go along with your own group, they'll cancel you for not going Definitely. along with them and adopting their point of view. So in the end, it will be a law of the jungle, survival of the fittest, who's the you know dominant group and um, uh, what do you think is is capitalism? I mean, you know, uh, having more wealth, having more resources, it's, it's just a war of resources in the end. Uh, if you see the war of power and power is for resources. So uh, do you agree on that or what are your viewpoints on that? I think capitalism is really under attack now more than ever before. Um, and that's why in the uh, presidential primaries, we had speakers, mostly the Democratic Party, who were saying we should be a socialist country, not a capitalist country. And there are a lot of people who follow that, especially millennials, youngsters, college students, because there's such a large concentration of wealth in the hands of just a few people that other people are just not sharing in the economic pie, or at least not sharing equitably. And I think this uh, aversion to capitalism, it's what, what's behind all the protests now. It goes beyond um, Black Americans being murdered in the streets. That's a very important aspect of it. But it is this uh, one group, which could be 1% of the population making all the wealth against the other group getting 99% of it. And it's, 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 we need to have a solution to this problem because it, it feeds violence. Um, yeah. Several years ago, it was called Occupy Wall Street. And that was yes. because of the financial recession, where very greedy people took advantage of financial transactions and hurt a lot of others who lost their wealth. So I'm sort of a, a capitalist, but with a socialist bent, because we have to take care of each other. We have Definitely. to think about the common good, not our own Definitely. selfish interests if we want to move forward in this country Definitely. and not be stuck where we are now. Definitely, because uh, we too believe that hate must be a disease. I mean, we're not born to hate each other. We were born to coexist. So if one group is trying to overpower the other, uh, it's just like uh, it, the equation won't work for too long. I mean, till how long one group can be suppressed for so long? So there has to be a balance of power and the balance of resources. At the end, it's all about resources. So, uh, Professor Saab, uh, coming um, to the uh, topic, the art of civility. I like the topic, the art of civility. I mean, um, uh, it's a very beautiful thing and a very deep and profound meaning with it. So why do you think that uh, is this the lapse because of our education? Because we are producing um, the kids who are very ambitious and we tell them that everything is very in love and war and business. Is this uh, is something wrong that we have done? Because uh, uh, we have seen this moral decline very steadily over the generations. 
you know very steadily so uh, i would really like you to dilate about it and uh, please uh, tell us about more about it yeah uh civility or lack thereof is a manifestation of ethical or unethical behavior now some people uh, look at civility i think very simplistically like it's it's a form of politeness it goes well beyond politeness it has to do with how we talk to each other we don't listen most yeah. people have preconceived notions about what's right and what's wrong and won't listen to somebody with a divergent viewpoint and that's a manifestation of a lack of civility just basic respect for alternative points of view uh, again it gets back to learning how to discuss things with others openly honestly not judgmentally and that's becoming a problem in society it it already is uh i always say how could we be a diverse society which the us is how could we want a diverse workplace different nationalities different religions but we don't seem to respect diversity in thought we want to shout them down we want to cancel them in some universities professors can't get a job if they adopt one point of view which is different than the prevailing view so as a result of a lack of civility we have these anger one group versus another group and shouting them down when they make a speech walking out on them very very disrespectful and it's now in our streets as we've seen the last couple of months and you know politicians are probably the worst of them all and i guess we'll see more about that as the election proceeds um so it's a very very complicated issue that i think we're just starting to understand i'm very sad personally that in the last 7 8 9 months that there have been um primary elections in the us i don't think i've ever heard one questioner in one debate say to the candidates do we have a problem with civility do we have a problem with ethics they're so busy talking about well the coronavirus which you can even say has civility elements to that because we're now told to wear masks whenever we're in the public you could say that's a function of civility because you're not only looking out for yourself but for your others for the common good so um if you don't wear a mask you could infect others and yourself could be infected if who you're talking to aren't and a lot of americans say hey we have freedom here in the us why don't we have freedom to decide whether we wear a mask or not whether we socially distance or not whether we have a big party with a lot of people or not um it's interesting i don't know if this was an international story but there was one situation where a lot of youngsters i think it was up to 60 people went to a party and it was very close quarters and the goal of the party was to see who got the coronavirus first and yes, that we, we, we saw that so <laughs> yeah i mean what kind of mind thinks about things yeah. like that so that's that's another element of civility the absolutely agree on that and uh, it's an art i mean you have to nurture it i mean you uh, from the family how you are brought up right from the values your family import uh, impart because family is the first uh, you know and and it has the most profound effect on the civility and the ethical uh, mindset that a person has that adopt and then comes the uh, part of the institution 
and of course it's an, another cycle that the family was a product of the institution the parents were the product of these education so what how would you place the role of educational institution in instilling this uh, art of civility and ethics uh, as a part of like uh, you know uh, embedded into the system like in the belief system with respect to ethics i think it should be uh infiltrated throughout the curriculum when we in the states debated this issue especially in business schools the question was do you have a separate course on ethics that maybe everybody is required to take or do you put a little bit of ethics in every course so you could cover the philosophy of ethics political ethics social ethics business ethics and um take maybe have a module in every course yeah. about it especially it's very important to take a course in your career in what you're studying about ethics so that could be introduced into a social political social environment course and there are different views here in the states about how to do that and we even have a lot of professors who say you can't teach ethics you can't do it what are you wasting your time well i always say that yes you can teach ethics i mean i better say that i've been doing it for 30 years um but what i say is you can teach ethics but that doesn't mean students are going to learn the lesson like any other subject matter they have to study it be committed to it uh maybe be exposed to case studies which is a popular way to teach ethics um and you have to have a committed professor and here in the states a lot of professors are afraid that by teaching ethics they're telling students what to do what to be and they just don't want to go there they feel very uncomfortable so someone like me comes along and says i have no problem with it i've been writing about it teaching about it and usually that's when only one course in ethics is developed because there's only one faculty member dedicated to teaching it at least in the business college so it's becoming more popular to teach ethics but nevertheless it's many colleges and universities do not require it they have it as an elective which i don't think is very good because given other choices as electives students don't tend to pick ethics uh in accounting for example they pick a technical subject such as how artificial intelligence is affecting accounting just to come up with one example so <laughs> so um uh... I'm very uh, thankful to you for you know highlighting and be a voice for the ethics and your blogs. So um, it was such a pleasure talking to you. The time went by and I don't know where does it went. I mean we have so much to learn from you and your wisdom and uh, ethics. I'm very passionate about it. We at Feel uh, Feel actually is a framework for emotions. ethics empowerment and then life skills so um, um, of course uh, we are trying our bit as well um, uh, uh, professor uh, professor means i would really like you to uh, tell us more about um, how they can develop this ethics i mean uh, how they can be more ethical in their life i mean what kind of choices what kind of suggestions in the end like you can uh, Uh, tell our viewers as a concluding note that uh, what are the framework what are the steps what are the things that they can do uh, to be more ethical and be more conscientious and you know uh, just be better person and develop a society that is harmonious and you know worth living for, worth living in actually right and i think i mentioned this before but you have to be committed to act in the common good not in your own selfish interest because you're not going to be able to be ethical if that's your philosophy because our interest sometimes clashes with the common good the coronavirus and masks that i mentioned would be one situation i think the second thing is you have to be motivated to want to be a good person 
if you don't really care that much, you say, well, maybe I'll be ethical, maybe I won't. That's not good. Ethics is not a relativistic turn. It's a relativistic point of view, because if it were, people could decide what's ethical, what's not in any situation they're involved in. Uh, we have certain standards of ethical behavior. It also it, it starts with the golden rule, right? Treat others the way you want them to treat us. So don't we want others to be honest with us, respect us, be kind, be compassionate, be empathetic, and so on. So it starts there. And then, of course, we could talk about the philosophy of ethics. So I think it's very important to teach some element of philosophy, whether it's Kantian uh, rights theory or utilitarianism, justice. I teach virtue ethics a lot wow. because it deals with the underlying character of the individual. And by talking about the character of an individual, we're telling students, this is what makes you a good person. And I mentioned them before, kindness, compassion, honesty. Another one is trustworthiness, uh, responsibility, accountability, fair-mindedness toward others. So that's a framework for discussing ethics. In accounting, it's easier to do than I think in general, because there is a code of ethics in accounting. And a lot of the elements do capture all these virtues. So as we teach ethics, we need to make sure students are committed because otherwise they won't be open to our discussion of ethics. And then we need a decision-making framework. Um, I use a framework that's relatively simple to use. First thing is you have to identify the ethical issue. What is it? Are you talking about sexual harassment, for instance? And then what are the laws? What are the rules? And then you say, okay, what are my alternative courses of action? And that's where the philosophy could come in. And then once I know the alternatives, I think about how ethical they are and how they may not be ethical by looking at their effects on stakeholders. So who are my stakeholders? Uh, women in the workplace, managers, the entity, and so on. So now you have a pretty good idea as to how people might be affected depending on what you want to do. So you can go ahead and apply the framework and make a decision that you think is in the best interest of the stakeholders. You're not going to satisfy everybody every time, but that's your goal. And then finally, I, I have five principles of ethical behavior. One I mentioned to follow the golden rule. Another one is to make things better. Do something in your life that improves the well-being of others, your neighbor, your friends, your family. And then the third one is be civil towards others, which we talked about. The fourth is to accept responsibility for your actions. Don't try to blame somebody else. Obviously, don't lie about what went on. And finally, reflect on your behavior. Did you act the way you thought you should act if you were being ethical? So that's usually the way I end every course. I start it with the five principles, end it with the five principles, and try to draw the students together. Amazing. Absolutely. Such a profound piece of advice that we have from you. And um, I believe that we need more ethical leaders and ethical role models as well, because we are not making heroes out of the people who, who you know, um, uh, bear the loss, but both were, uh, you know, choose to be ethical. So we are uh, idealizing and, you know, um, making superheroes of the people who gained wealth instead of how ethical and how uh, they show the character in the uh, in the time when they could gain something so sometimes being uh, loss is also a gain 
if it it was on the ethical grounds so i think we need more people like you more role model like you more professors who think like you and more people who would talk the difficult talk that yeah. uh, are not uh, you know kind of the most positive narrative around right now so so uh, lucky to you know have a, have you with us and it was such a pleasure and i couldn't thank you enough for giving us time and uh, um, definitely we'll be engaging you again and again and uh, thank you so much professor uh, for giving us your time it was indeed an honor and in the end ladies, ladies and gentlemen like we always say and like uh, professor mens has uh, again and again said be kind be ethical and be empathetic uh, we were all here to coexist so this is all uh, we are just same human species uh, the melanin uh, melatonin in our skin should not be the reason to segregate uh, your tribe or my tribe is not important we are just a very big mosaic you know a part of a scheme in a very big mosaic we have to play our part so this world can only be a better place if we think uh, like us not like i so uh, in the end thank you so very much we had a pleasure talking with you thank and you. um and um, uh, take good care of yourself thank you thank so much you. thank you allah hafiz okay okay